Hey Grinder School, welcome back. We are here for part two of my live session of 100 NL for tabling on stars. Uh, we missed probably like nine hands, I think, as a way for the blinds to come around to me. Although I did post dead once, and I felt like a donk doing that. So I don't usually post dead unless I uh, make a mistake in doing so. And leave the auto post blinds checked on between sitting out. So All right. Uh, we've played around, you know, 250 hands, I think, in the first hour, so we're going to go ahead and try and match that again. Maybe it was actually like 200 hands. I'm not, I'm not really certain. But we're, I'm doing pretty well right now. I think we're going to be up... Uh, we might be up like 75 big blinds, but I'm not really too worried about that. All right. Our, our first decision that we're going to face is whether or not we want to isolate this ace-queen against this under the gun limper. I say this all the time. When a tight opponent like open limps under the gun and calls a raise, he's got like two two through five five or two two through like maybe even like sevens, uh, a very wide percentage, very high percentage at the time. If uh, someone who likes to limp re-raise or whatever, he limp re-raises me here. I'm probably it's gonna be a very easy fold. He's got like aces or something like that. Um, very good board for me, but very bad board for me in trying to get value of from my opponent, given his range. Uh, let's go. I don't, didn't notice if this guy posted or not, but I don't think he did. So, I'm going to complete. Um, so, I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and check to him and try to make it look like I actually have a missed ace-king here, and I'm trying to check it down. Um, he's going to be turning a lot of hands into bluffs, including, like, twos through fives. You know, I'm representing a very weak hand myself and, like, missed ace-king. Maybe a hand like tens or eights, something like that. I can't fold to this guy now, like post flop, once I hit my hand. Um, I don't think he actually calls anything, so my only. Again, I, I put his hand range on like twos through sevens. So I'm going to go ahead and check to him and try and see if he's going to try and bluff me off a hand again. He might he might have hit that five, and if he does, then that's okay. Then I'll pay him off here. But like, if he hits a two otter on me, then he hits a two otter on me, you know? Like, we both hit ace queen. It's actually a very bad spot for... He open limps ace-queen under the gun. Um, I think if he does that with ace-queen... Uh, I don't really understand why he's limp calling there under the gun with ace-queen, but... Uh, my range for value raising there probably against him would be... Like, ace-queen are better and, like, tons are better. So he's not doing so well on a call preflop uh, against that range. Okay, we have fives up here on the top right corner against a fairly tag opponent and who's going to be going to be c betting us uh, a lot. So I'm going to be more likely to call on boards where I don't feel like my opponent hit. Uh, in this situation though, my opponent hit this board so often that it doesn't even matter like what hand I have right here. I'm probably going to be folding it. Um, uh, do, I'm going to go ahead and make a, a loose isolation play with the jet gate suited. He's at the cusp of the players I like to do this with. Um, for this, for the stack size reasons, he needs like at least 30 big blinds for me to feel not weird about isolating him up and then c betting him off like a uh, hand and not feel pot committed. So 30 big blinds is that ra is that range. And since we have second pair here, I'm actually going to be betting and planning on getting this in against this guy. I feel like his check raising range right now is going to include a 10, but it's also going to include like maybe queen jack, um, a couple clubs, you know, maybe like jack nine, all those kind of hands. Or go ahead and overlump these fives. So we can most certainly like bet call, and his stack is so short that we really can't bet fold with the five to one pot uh, SPR. And we got like 10 queen suited here. I think we're going to open this again. We are in the hijack and not middle position right now. All you have to do is take a look at the guy to our left sitting out. Uh, we'll fold in those mid rays. You could call there. If he was a donk, I would call, but it looks like he's got st uh, taggy stats. Now, what I, s I'm, I didn't go over my HUD in video one, and I apologize for that. I normally do uh, go over the HUD in each of my videos, just in case this is always the first video that you watch, then I want it to have a good example. The blue number is always going to be the number of hands played, and I recommend 
all every, anybody ever who has a HUD out there, make your number of hands always blue. Um, it's one of those one of those colors that always stands out, and you never get it confused with any other stat if it's always blue. The other five stats, though, are a, are a range of colors for anywhere on the color rainbow from from green to red. Um, so I go from like green, yellow, like green, dark green, light green, yellow, like light red and dark red, um, and very much so it's like following a stoplight, right? So the the greener it is, the more the more profitable it is going to be for me uh, in most scenarios. The redder it is, the more I'm going to want to avoid that situation against that opponent. Uh, let's go ahead and take this Johnny Mox on, for example, here. Guy to my right on table two. All right, he's got all three colors. Um, the red color here uh, it means watch out because this is his VPIP. And anybody who's got under VPIP of 20 is going to be someone that's going to be on the fairly tight side. Uh, I don't know if you can tell in the video or not, but this guy's 19 is a little bit lighter shade of red than the guy with the 14 or the 9. I believe I had it. So I have it set up so that my HUD uh, under like 15 is the dark red, and those guys are the extreme tight opponents. Uh, the yellow, on the other hand, is kind of like a, like a warning or watch out. And uh, a guy with a 15% preflop raise, as this guy is here with the second number across his preflop raise, the yellow itself is going to be like you know watch out, you know be careful. A lot of donks have 15% preflop raises. And, you know, if he has a high VPIP, then, you know, um, it's probably going to be a favorable situation. If he doesn't have a high VPIP, then he's probably going to be more along the tag sense uh, of, of scenarios. Um, it looks like I have VPIP, or prefop raises under 12, as this guy's 11 is red, um, as red, and anything over from like 13 to probably uh, 20 are in the yellow category. 20 over here is green, so like anything under 20 is probably going to be in the yellow. Um, t it took me like five minutes to set this up, and I use it so often. The third number itself is uh, folded continuation bets on the flop. Um, I use this number a lot when determining whether or not I should be isolating an opponent pre-flop. If I'm playing against a, ba a bad donkey, and... You know, he never folds pre-flop or post-flop, then I won't be wanting to isolating him with my marginal hands because he never folds. Um, the last two numbers, and, and again, those color ranges are between, like, dark green for 100% and probably, like, dark red for 50%. This, this guy's got 50% here and it's dark red. So, um, and those are, like, color-coded throughout between, uh, the, between, the, between the levels. Uh, the last two numbers on the HUD are the full blind steel stats. Uh, the, the the very last number is fold big blind of steel, and the number left of that is fold small blind of steel. And I have those numbers up there uh, in that order just because that's the order that they appear on the table. You know, like small blinds first and the big blind from the button. So that just keeps me uh, keeps me focused or whatever, and so I remember what stats are which. And again, those are in the green variety. Someone who's got like looks like 86 is green and 75 is yellow. So, you know, along those lines, 80 is going to be green. Probably, I think, lower than 70 is going to be, like, a little bit of red here, as 60 is red. And most certainly anything less than 50 is going to be, like, the dark red. So, I thought I'd explain that, and I, I like, I'm a little bit wordy on it, so I apologize, but I think we'll be all be okay. All right, I raise, uh, I'll be raising up this 5-7 offset hand to fold around to me. 8-8 um, eight, eight makes... A re-raise here, and I've got ace queen and under the gun. Um, this is actually an interesting position. I think I'm just going to go ahead and fold it. Uh, to be honest, it's a very knit fold. If we weren't heads up, if if we were heads up, I might go with it. Um, I feel like his d range for doing this though is ace queen and ace king, and not ace jack. And he probably is going to have like pairs, like sevens or higher. So against that range, I might have the equity to go with it. I just don't think so. I don't, and it's probably not going to be a plus CV call. Um, if we were in late position, I'd most certainly do it. If we were in middle position where I'm going to be having a wider opening range than under the gun. Keep in mind that like when I open under the gun, the thinking players are going to feel that like I have a much tighter range than normal. And it's going to be most certainly true. Alright, this is the, like the... Again, this guy keeps um, blind stealing. Um... Don't really like to do it with ace two suit. I much prefer to have like king queen. 
If he were, if he was, if he had a deeper stack right now, I would most certainly be like re-raising him a lot, like, um, as as a bluff. But with twenty big blinds, my only maneuver really is to re-raise and get it in pre-flop. So against that hand range, I look for a little bit more equity. Um, however, I cer I certainly think that I can re-raise there with a wide range, and still feel like it's gonna be profitable. So don't keep don't think that I, I'm not noticing this guy's like blind selling my, my blind because it happened from an earlier video too. So that was the first time it happened in this video, but if you're not watching these videos back to back, you might not realize that that's probably the third time that he's raised my blind. Um, I, mean, I believe that probably was the number that I saw. So keep that in mind. I'm I'm on the lookout for that situation. Uh, we don't have a diamond, and let's go ahead and check call. Alright, so we have kings. We're, there's really no donks behind us to protect against. Um... And so we can just go ahead and re-raise it in this end. I th a lot of times I do prefer calling here against like bigger stacks. I kind of feel like it's a lot more trouble than it's worth. And we're just gonna fold the open under. Yeah, we're in a tough spot, but there's really not much we can do. Given that this guy is kind of an unknown through like 60 hands, so we're just going to go ahead and get it in. Make sure we have the time bank so we don't time out while we're doing this. This happens when you right click also. Yeah, like Adam, like if, if Al Tom is really a tight player, like if I had a read on him, he's going to have like aces a lot here. But there's not really much we can do when we run kings and aces. Yeah. Of any player, I expected him to have the aces. Um, like, we only had 12 hands on him, though. So, like, there's really not much we can do there, even though he does flat a raise and a re-raise. He could very easily be, like, a donk who just hasn't played enough hands yet and have, like, ace jack or whatever. But there's really not much we can do to get away from that hand, you know. Well, it, I, You see a lot of players that, like, oh, did I play this right? It's like, well, you get kings and you get it in preflop against someone who's got 60 big blinds, you know. What better way are you wanting to get it in? Um, I guess if we had a larger sample on him and he called the flat raise and re-raise cold, then yes, we would want to be playing it differently. But again, we were ahead of the original guy who decided to four bet with his queens against the re-raise and a guy calling calling that cold, which is invariably a much worse play than what I did. I, mean, I was kind of just forced to do whatever I did because this opponent decided to open the betting again. Um, you know, like, if he decided to just call preflop again, which would be pretty bad. I'm not saying that like he shouldn't have gone with his queens there, because he, he definitely should have. But, you know, I got pot stuck because my opponent g gave me, put me in the opportunity to be, to do so. And there wasn't much that I could do there. And you got to realize that fact, that you're going to get cooler a lot. And, you know, when you have aces there, it's going to be the exact same way with you. So, you know, if you get aces, kings, and queens together all in the same hand, the way those stacks lined up, yeah, they're going to get them in, and, you know, oh well. That's why we played this game, though, with more than, you know, five buy-ins, because, you know, there is some inherent variance to the play. Eh, do you want to turn our hand to a bluff? Hmm. If I didn't have twos, if I had a hand like 9-10 suited, or even like king-queen, I like betting more, because we have more equity when we're behind, but... And pen like pocket twos has very little equity when behind. Alright, we're gonna be isolating the ace queen. And equity when behind is a very big key factor when trying to make a bluff. Um, king queen there is a lot better. Just because someone's gonna have a jack a lot of the time, and we're going to be able to. Oh, okay, check raises? This guy's almost certainly has got like a set of jacks. Otherwise, a very horrible play like pocket aces. Alright, so we are heads up on this flop. I'm not going to be c betting this flop. This is the same situation that we were in video one, where we had ace king in position. If it like if it's three way, I might be c betting it, but since it's not, I'm just going to take it back. He limp calls early position, so he's going to have like a crappy like a weak range a lot. The six of spades though is a spot where we're probably not going to be picking off um, try to pick off a bluff. Our hand is kind of crappy uh, in terms of like equity wise. He can be value betting us here with anything from like, you know, 3-4 all the way up to like 8-7 or 
And even if he has like a spade, he's got a lot of equity against us, so there's not really much we can do. I'm going to go ahead and make a weak isolate with the jack 10 suited. All right. And fold it. If that paired like the 3, 5, or 8, um, and without the spade coming in, I would much rather call it. Uh, and that's a good enough board for us to be able to get it in. I don't want a full Jack-10 suit to their preflop. I feel like a limp is going to get us in trouble by players, and that's the good nuts. Um, let's go ahead and bet something stupid like $5 again, so he calls. We have the nuts with a nut redraw, so I'm not worried about anything. There we go. Yeah, we'll min raise you back, put him and hold him. And against the tight guy in the big blind, you know, we have the nuts. Or we were pretty much raising any two cards, so any two cards is the nuts against that guy. It looks like we are dropping one of these tables here, so um, I'm going to go ahead and get another table up, and I'm going to pause the video until I get that back. So it will be a minute after I blind steal this hand. Or I guess I'll wait until the button, the big blind gets around to me again, and I'll go ahead and do that. And yeah, I could blind steal three short stacks and a, and, and a tag here, but no thank you. <laughs> I'll just go ahead and leave now. I'll, I'll be right back. And we're back. We got ourselves the table up. We're going to go ahead and auto post dead in the b on the cutoff when we get it. Uh, let's see here. Ace-9 suited is an okay hand that we can call a min-raise without the blinds. Um, we're getting a, a pretty good price. For anything more than a min-raise, probably would call it. Looks like this guy's pretty bad. Buying in for, you know, has less than half a stack and min-raises it. And we flop top pair. Tell what we're going to do. Let's go ahead and lead this one. I tell you what, we're going to feel pretty cheesy like going for a check raise. Um, and we're not going to have any idea where the hell we're at. If this guy, if we check and this guy bets it and he kind of calls or whatever. If we bet it now and we get called and this guy raises, it's a very easy fold for us. There's a lot of dirty turn cards for us too. Um, that's, not one that, that's not really all that dirty. Our opponent's going to be calling us with like 9-8, 9-7, 6-7, and all that stuff. And we check to him, he could very easily do something like stupid, like min raise or min bet or do something like that. Um, now, if he shoves us on that flop, then we might go ahead and let it go. But I feel like the best way for us to get value there is to lead into the donk and let him call us with whatever range that he has. If this were King Queen, um, if you guys remember from the other video, it looks like this table is getting short too. Uh, Yugor went ahead and reshipped us in the last video, and so I'm going to keep in mind that he might be doing it again, and I think King Queen is a good hand to be chip, um, snapping off guys who like to re-raise light. I don't like to, uh, when I'm, when I'm doing videos, I don't like to change tables. I feel like it's very confusing for uh, the subscribers, for you guys, so... I don't like to do that, and a lot of you guys, you know, if you guys want to see me play against regs, you guys can see me play against regs. Um, which invariably is what happens on some tables, or they just can become full of regs. It's thick. And I've got no problem, like, doing that. Alright, so we're going to go ahead and pause you guys again, I'll be right back. And we're back. So, that was... We didn't miss anything. But yeah, I mean, I... I feel like it's really unprofessional to just keep changing tables. I only do it when it takes away from the game itself, you know, where the game starts getting shorthanded. And we're doing a full ring video, not necessarily like Code Red plays poker today. So, if we pose dead though, we're going to be brazing the cutoff, because we can. We probably don't have to make it four, we only have to make it three, but we're still only risking three to win two and a half. Um, and our race size is... Pr oh, we don't really don't want that much action either, given the fact that we have Mr. Weak Hand. A lot of players are going to call the number 3 down here with the Ace-10 suited, and I don't like doing it at all. Again, I like having more than one player in the pot when we make this call. Um, 
we're not really going to be doing it for value. A lot of player, a lot of my students though, that I find, like, they just get so infatuated with a the hand, they just they think it's really pretty. Um, that's the reason why fish play hand is because they think it's very pretty. Like, it's got two diamonds, so you know that's going to make them rich. But that's not the case. All right, ace king. How do we play it? Well, we have a tight player opening in early position. That means we call. A lot of I've seen a lot of players be like, "Oh, you got to re-raise this," and no, I mean, re-raising this hand is going to be like pretty much poker suicide. Um, our opponent is re-raising such a uh, such a narrow range pre-flop that we're not really representing all too much post-flop. Now we can determine like how we want to react. Now, I feel like the still the best way to go ahead and is to go ahead and call. Um, if Darth Bozo raises, we probably will fold. I think he's got the most likelihood of having a wider range, like fours, um, ace, ten is going to be in his range. The only range that we really beat right now is like uh, king, queen suited or some kind of like combo draw that he's going to be more likely to call with in position than out of position. So I think he's going to have a, a pretty tight range here. And we're going to make a pretty tight fold even though I'm out of position. I was thinking about raising the flop um, myself just to kind of protect my hand and see where Darth is at, but you know, I think at worst he has like Queen Jack suited and King Queen suited there and at best I'm like splitting, I think, like Ace King um, no, I, I guess worst case scenario for him so it's a, it's a, it is a fairly tight fold, but I'm looking to get value out of really the preflop raiser you know, the cold collar behind I don't think he has, like, just a bare flush draw there. I think raising a bare flush draw there is going to kind of suicidal because you are getting odds to draw for the flush itself. Now, I'm not really saying that he doesn't do that, but um, given how much we have invested in the hand, you know, we we really don't need to make any, like, uh, you know, loose calls. Now, I I probably, if it were just, if it were heads up between, and I had, like, Irwin check to us and we bet it out and we get raised, I probably would have called the re probably would have called the flop raise there, and check fold the turn majority of the time. A lot of a lot of players at this level, if they bluff raise the flop or some bluff raise the flop, they are not willing to barrel the turn for fear of getting check raised off their semi bluff. I think the probability of Darth Bozo there having a complete air is uh, rare to none. I think he's got complete air there zero percent of the time. And I think he has like ace queen or ace jack there zero percent of time making that raise, whereas him he's cold calling preflop with like ace ten, um, probably ace king because I'm cold calling preflop with ace king, um, and I can see myself raising ace king on that board too, because I almost did, but you know against someone who's going to be like we're going to be putting a lot of money and trying to split the pot. Um, I'm also going to be calling that flop though too with like my own nut hands like uh, aces. I'm gonna have I'm gonna have tens. I'm also gonna have fours. I'm probably not gonna have ace ten or ace four. But my po those hands are still my opponent's range for value. Now I had Irwin come in and called. I probably would still. Oh, it's a more interesting dynamic if Irwin comes in and calls, but because again, I still think we're ahead of his hand. Um, but it's really a matter of if we're gonna be ahead of Darth Bozo, Bozo's hand or not. Furthermore, we're also out of position, which makes our hand very difficult to play. And the net thing to do is to fold. And I know no one likes to fold top pair, top kicker, uh, especially on a drawing board. But in some instances, like, it's just going to be like, the best way to play it, or the easiest way to play it, too. And a lot of times in these full ring games, you know, avoid the tough spots and you're going to make money in the long run. That said, I don't hate myself raising the flop either. Um, kind of for value, because we're certainly going to be ahead of Irwin. And let's see, how much do we need to raise it pre? Probably just five or six, probably six. Yeah, stop calling, whatever. These guys, neither of these guys are getting really set odds other than Curtis James. So we're checking out with everybody here. This guy's SPR is less than one. This guy's SPR of two. So we're getting in, and it doesn't really matter how the action goes down. We're going to go ahead and bet 12. Um... Worst case scenario, we have like six outs. Yeah. Okay. We're getting like we're getting over three to one. Uh, with six outs, we need three to one. So we're definitely getting pot odds, even if we're just drawing to the gut shot. 
or maybe an ace or maybe a ten pairing or something. I had a both? Nope, ten jack. Ten jack calling there is, is pretty bad pre-flop, but... Uh, we ended up breaking even on that play because we got with the king nine, and we still had... We had over ten outs, I believe. We had the... Um, no, I guess we didn't have 10 outs. We were, our outs were pretty much well dominated by everybody. But, let's see. I called the king to end the big blind. We were getting a pretty damn good price. I think it was like $2 to call on an $8 pot. So we were getting like 4 to 1 on our money. We don't need that great of odds to make the call. Okay. Again, open limper. We are going to be checking this. And I think I'm going to fold the threes. He doesn't really blind steal enough to um, to warrant being able to, to cold call him or to re-raise him for, as a bluff, but he doesn't really, um, how do you say, like, he doesn't really raise too little either that we can, you know, set mine profitably. So it's one of those awkward spots where folding is going to be the best option over threes. And as you can see, I'm just check calling my 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 second pair decent kicker down. Uh, one, I feel like I'm pretty far ahead, and two, my my opponent isn't betting very much at all. Then I think that I'm actually going to be ahead. If he comes out and bets big here, I probably will be folding. But you know, for a dollar, getting nine to one, you know, we can go ahead and make the call. And he, and he does show us like queen nine. So we had five outs, um, at worst, and we were we pay like four dollars, I think. The entire knee of the hand. Um, the only other way to play it would be to bet the flop, like two or three dollars yourself. And in that instance, like it only costs us one extra more dollar to see the to see the river. So, and there's always a chance that we were able to get him to bluff. Um, so we turn our hand into a bluff catcher, and, and he seems to be like limping a lot. And players who who do limp a lot, I find they like to um, uh, they they like to bet when bet when they're checked to. And that's a really good spot to do with a marginal hand. And yeah, you're not going to win every time, but you know we lost that hand there, and it cost us between you know, four big blinds. And so we're not really risking too much either. And we get we get information on what our opponent's limping in preflop with. Uh, if we find that Darth Bozo here is actually isolating a wide range, he m it makes a very good candidate for him to be th to be three bet. Um, so if he keeps isolating that same opponent, you know, don't be afraid or don't be surprised to see me sit there and try and re raise that guy for as a bluff. Seven eight offsuit is a pretty good spot, so he looks like he's isolating him again. Um, and he raised even one more in this position, so that's kind of an uh, interesting situation too. So keep in mind that I'm paying attention. I don't know if anybody else is paying attention on this table. I think Ugor is probably on like twenty tables. And that's fine by me because he's not really gonna be you know taking any money off of me. Someone who plays ABC standard like that, and Jesperman. Like if I'm but Darth Bozo here, I'm gonna be like bluff raising everything from like Queen Jack to Queen Ten. But you don't have to make it too much. Probably just eight dollars. And I think it's very important in in full ring play to not let these guys stonk bet you off your hand. Um, if you had like King Ten though, I probably would just check it back, or I'm sorry, call his little weak bets down. Um, if you had like Ace Two, I probably would call his little weak bets down. But like. All my gut shots and flush shots and stuff, I'd be, I'd be like bluff raising him. But it, it looks like he just likes to dunk, lead anything at the same time that he has a hand. Um, another common spot we're out of position here with the sixes and an ace high board, and uh, we could check it to our opponent, but I think we're going to be representing the ace here. Kind of turning our hand into a bluff, kind of protecting our hand. There's a chance we are going to be ahead, but out of position, like. If we check to him, we're actually going to give up on the pot too much. That makes raising the under the gun unprofitable. But we can um, go ahead and see bet it, and it makes it a little bit more profitable. Like if we had a hand like pocket tens here, obviously see betting it would not be the mo most correct play. But a hand like sixes is a little bit different than pocket tens. Um, against tougher opponents, I'm not really more. I'm not really likely to be raising the sixes under the gun. Um, this is probably the borderline level where I raise pairs under the gun or not. I feel like probably at this stage on some tables they're break even the raise. Sometimes they're going to be plus CV. At 200 Denel, I normally do not raise pairs less than sevens under the gun. I just go ahead and fold them. Uh, but against someone who folds the C bets a lot, 
and we really don't know if this guy is the case or not, but I feel like if we check it to him there, you know, we're going to be giving up with the best hand so often, and being out of position, it's not very, it's not going to be that minus if you get a turn made hands into bluffs. Let's see, I, uh, we got a little bit of downtime here. Um, I mentioned last video about going to Vegas, and uh, I'm trying to get my girlfriend to come with me to Chicago to visit my family. She's 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 getting out of school here in I think one week and that's gonna be good. Uh, let's uh she's in she's going to grad schools but she's also working full time so I barely ever get to see her. Um and let's see the bunny if you guys have fucky blind I do have a bunny rabbit and I took her to get her neutered I think I talked about this maybe um and I feel like I felt like I knew more about bunny rabbits than the vet did so I had to find a a new vet in the area, and apparently there's a good one an hour away if you want to drive an hour. Uh, I certainly do not want to, but I might have to. And otherwise, she's doing pretty cool too. She likes to sit by my chair and bug me while I'm talking to uh, what seemingly probably to her is nobody. <laughs> We're talking to myself because I'm just talking to a microphone. And otherwise, I'm kind of excited summer's coming around. We have a swimming pool here on the apartment complex, and that becomes available in a month after 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 Memorial Day, or May 31st, I guess, uh, for all of those not in the United States. So I can't really wait for that. It's, it was pretty damn warm this last weekend. It was like 95, and, you know, for April, it was very, very unique for me to have that. Alright, so the King-10 um, is a very standard spot for us to blind raise and, you know, again, see what hands we're going to be missing. Queen-Jack suited is not going to be a spot we're going to be um, raising it up, though. And if we get re-raised, though, we don't really have a problem in folding. A lot of these players, most of these players, in fact, I'm not going to say like all of these players are not re-raising enough to really exploit any of you guys. One complaint that I hear my students say a lot is, like, as, as they move up levels, you know, they're afraid of, or they see, like, three bets happening more and more, and, and, um, yeah, just to let you guys know, you, you guys aren't really raising enough to be exploited, you know, and even so much so, like, they're not being, they're not, even if you are raising enough to be exploited, like, your opponent isn't three betting you enough to exploit you, or purposely coming after you and doing so, especially the regs or whatever. Like, are you guys... I, I see this guy who's like a 6-4 or the 9-6 or 9-3 through like 400 hands. And or this guy's like 14-3. I mean, these guys are so tight that they're probably barely squeezing out... Uh, barely squeezing out like a couple... You know, maybe like one BB per 100 or while winning FPPs or whatever on stars. And not really the way to either learn poker or practice poker. Right. So, King-Queen offsuit here... A lot of players will try and call this um, feeling that, again, it's very pretty. This is not a situation where you want to call it. Again, we want to have more than one opponent. This table itself is actually pretty damn horrible. I'm not going to lie. Like The only fish on the table is that 20 big blinds. I don't like to stay on those tiny tables, but I will do so for the for the sake of the video. Um, so we're kind of playing kind of ABC standard here. Hopefully we can get ourselves in a couple more, couple more interesting spots. I think I was telling one of my students this past week that um, I think a shelf life for one of my tables. I don't know if I'd change it. Uh, probably like around half an hour for a shelf life of a table. Um, anything longer than that? I mean, it doesn't really. It, to me, it depends on like if the opponent how, t how bad the table is. Um, but on average, I'm saying if I'm nine tabling 100 and L, I'm changing like each table every half an hour. So, you know, if you were to average that out, you're looking at changing a table every, oh, whatever, 9 divided by 3, 30 is, right? Uh, 30 divided by 9. So, like, once every, like, three and a half minutes, I'm changing on a table. And, and even on these four tables, you know, every 30 minutes, I'm changing one out. I'm probably going to be changing one every, like, eight or nine minutes on average, um, if I were these guys. Uh, what did Uger open up? Raise their preflop. 
ace queen suited. So like I said, he's very he's following our mold of standard poker players in that position. Uh, ace queen is going to be a very standard value raise in the spot, and we're and we're going with any flop just because he's got only he's only got like nine dollars. Um, we're committed against his short stack too. That's a good hand. Uh, normally I like to bet to these guys with like a weak ace, but we can go ahead and bet for value ourselves with the two pair. And we're going to be getting it in too. If under the gun there, stop calling to our left was fairly tight, then I can see myself like buffing that flop. We can go ahead and value bet now on this turn. I feel my opponent's gonna be calling me here with a nine, a five, a spade. We have the we have the ass end of the straight now, so I'm gonna go ahead and check to him and let him try and like bluff the uh, streets for me. What's this guy's attempt to steal? Twenty five percent. I'll go ahead and bump him up. I get nine. Didn't mean to make it ten, but yeah. So he had himself a pretty strong hand there on the on the turn up. I got value from it. Uh, it's we really can't fold the ass end of the straight on the river. You know we were kind of like value betting a little bit because he's gonna be like bluffing the the flush draw a lot too when the straight comes in. Um, and we're getting a good prize. We're getting like well we're getting two to one. So he's got means he's got to be bluffing at one and three. Um, and we, it's not like we don't have air either. You know we do have. Like the third nuts, or the second nuts, so it's not bad. Uh, A7 offsuit is, is an okay hand to re raise that guy with. I didn't mean to make it 10, it was kind of a misclick there. Um, too much going on. I was going to make it like 8 or 9, but it seems like, first off, I noticed that his min raise is his standard open, and he's raising quite a bit from every position with the 18 16. Um, and I don't need much full equity there for my re-raise to be profitable. Um, given the fact that I do have a blocker with the ace, it's not the most, like, plus EV hand to do it with, but I prefer to do it with, like, um, at least, I think an A7 is okay. Usually A7 suit is better because they have more playability post-flop. Uh, however, just starting to, to re-raise these guys as a bluff is going to going to be show profit. Alright, let's go ahead and isolate this guy with the jack ten. Now isolating like these players is somewhat high of variance, right? Because you know we're only going to hit the flop one and three, and he's hitting the flop one and three if he's got a couple of over cards or whatever. So you know keep that in mind. But we're doing it a for because we can. You know we have position on them, and we're taking advantage of our opponent's leaks of like limping too much. We we're going to win the pot outright sometimes too because we did there, and he's going to call and like fold the flop to us a lot also. Now, keep in mind that I don't, like, you know, see what every flop, but um, I will more than others. This is a spot where we could blind steal from this position. Given how tight a table this is, again, we can take advantage of our opponent's tight maneuvers, or tight players, and just blind steal to high heaven. I'm going to go about another seven or eight minutes, six, seven minutes. I'll uh, probably give me enough for another round, and uh, then I'm gonna load up Holder Manager, and we'll, con we'll go ahead and uh, go over the stats and some of the hands and stuff from this last session. Doing like a little two-part video seems kind of seems kind of nice. It feels like I haven't done a nice long session for you guys in quite a while. I could do a longer one, you know, like a four a four-part session if you guys really felt like it. Um, where I sit there and I do four hours, although, um, to be honest, I really don't play uh, too much uh, full ring uh, anymore. The most full ring uh, that I get into is from my coaching, I, and I do coach actually quite a bit. So I still very much so hang around the game in that regard. Let's go ahead and lead. And I'm going to tell you guys the same thing I tell like my students, is that like, Poker is poker, regardless. Maybe I shouldn't have made that bet because the doc guy there was like four dollars, but whatever. Uh, 
poker is poker regardless of, you know, the rules or the game that you're playing. Um, right now I'm playing a lot of heads up, actually, poker, and it's re and it's extreme. I've mentioned this before in one of my earlier videos that it's really helping me out in hand reading and, you know, calling guys down light. Um, so, and it's also a lot of fun for me. Um, so, I, I have been playing, like, I, I do ghost a lot of full rank for my students, and I do a lot of hand history reviews. And I was so immersed in it for so long that I still feel like I still think a lot of in, in full ring situations. But for as of lately, like I think for the past over a month um, from now, I've been playing strictly heads up. And like I mentioned in my previous video, it wasn't because of you know any kind of like me losing or any monetary aspects, and quite not that at all. I just felt like. Uh, I just got extremely bored with it, and I I couldn't handle the 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 monotony that that full ring gives me when I'm just doing the same thing day in and day out. So you know maybe like one day in the future I'll go back to it, and you know if, you know if as I grow higher in stakes too, then I'll probably find some good games and I'll play those too. But for right now, like the heads up is my calling, and so there's a good chance I'll be doing some heads up videos after I return from Vegas when I get another month of experience in my play and. Um, Hopefully that'll work out for me too. I'm not gonna be. I feel kind of awkward doing videos for you guys that I don't feel comfortable doing. So, um, or I don't feel like I'm gonna be at show profit doing. So keep that in mind too. I think that guy's hands goes there. But uh, otherwise, I mean that's pretty much what's going on in my life. Um, don't have the swine flu yet. That's a good thing. Uh, I could call or I could raise. I might actually call this one because I'm in position. I feel like I can I can play. I'll play this guy in position while while playing heads up. Whether that's going to be like to float him in position or just like take a pot away. If he check calls me here, he has like a weak ace uh, almost always. So, like a weak ace is in like ace three, ace four, maybe like ace six or ace seven. And I don't think he's gonna be folding to if I to me if I bet. Um, uh, he might actually have a hand like sixes or sevens here, that I just now rivered him on. I'd I mean, feel more confident if I had a king, um, but I still think he has a weak ace. I might be good though. Ace nine. Yeah, uh, I think if I'm him, I I still buy bet it because I'm gonna be like. Uh, there's a good chance I'm going to get kind of frisky and do something stupid like, you know, float him on the ace side board, represent it, um, maybe um, bet the turn. I think in order for him to merge his range there, he's got to be betting the ace when he has it, has it as much as often as he's as he's betting the ace when he doesn't have it, you know. If you always check that ace there when you hit it with a no kicker, um, but you always bet it when you miss it, then you know, you're going to be pretty exploitable in that sense. All right, we have the aces. Let's go ahead and bump these up to a normal 5x. That's 7x. We don't need to make it 7. Uh, my range here is actually going to be pretty tight in table 4. But we are playing against a pretty bad player. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't. Uh, give us any action. Pretty normal. Uh, like I said, I I could have re-raised the king eight. Uh, I wasn't feeling it as a bluff as much as I was the first time. I feel like it's going to be too obvious. He kind of wants me to call there. I mean, def calling the min raise itself, I know inherently is going to be profitable. Um, however, like the second time I re-raise somebody in the same situation, he's going to feel like I'm trying to exploit him. Um, King-8 also doesn't have that much value to a hand. If I always re-raise him when I get min-raise there at the King-8, I'm doing it with a wide range of hands, then I'm going to be exploitable on my three bets. And that's something I don't want to happen. Uh, I'm just going to fold the King-10. Ooh, queens and a king high board. How do you guys want to play this? 
Well, we could get some value from from his from his um, gut shots. We're gonna go ahead and check it back, and try and get two streets from him on the turn and river. We're kind of doing a combination like pot control, but you know what? We also can, we also can get some value from him post flop too, by checking behind. Depending on what river comes, I'm gonna be less lucky to value bet on the river. Um, what the hell does he have here? Calls and then check weak raises. Uh, I think he's representing um, something stupid, so I'm gonna go ahead and call him. And if he bets big on the river, I, I will be letting it go. But I do have a gut shot there, and I do beat nine ten right now. Um, and he's gonna be he's gonna be like giving up on the nine ten. I check, but my checking back though seems like it's kind of weak. Um, but so does his little like check raise. So he could be check raising me with like anything from like king jack, king ten, king nine. Um, a lot of hands. Uh, it's really, really awkward for him to have this complete air, and he's, uh, he doesn't really have like the donkey stats to really do it. Um, we were getting a really good price to call on the turn, practically a min raise, um, which also makes it feel like that he was just not full of, sh uh, full of shit on the turn. So I will go ahead and fold it, although I'm not really liking it. Like that's the problem with like checking back on the flop. Um, is that you do like induce? You will induce some bluffs, like on the, of the check raise variety. Um, how much is really uncertain. I really have like he, he's not that aggro. Like if he was a complete maniac, then I'd be more likely to call him down there. Um, okay, this guy's really weak. Open shutting seventeen dollars to win a dollar and a half. Um, so much so that like I don't even need to make like a loose call here with the ace nine to make my fold profitable. He, it's so weak that he's just afraid to play. I mean, I've only played like one hand anyway on that table. This is a spot where like I would like to call my sevens, but because I know that he's got like kings are like kings are better here a hell of a lot, if not more than more than that, and it will be getting somewhat set odds. But I know that like it's gonna be break even at best, and possibly even like not profitable to call this. Even though I know his range is extremely tight, uh, like he he has to has like aces here every time and pay me off every time post swap for me to make this for me to make this profitable and it, and it's just not. If I had like jacks or queens though, I'd be more willing to to go ahead and and call the re-raise. Um, yeah, but either way, I feel like his range is uh, extremely t extremely narrow there. That's the same guy who like called the raise and re-raise through hub with aces, I do believe. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, it, the only hand that I've really seen him play that was the aces hand. He didn't even re-raise that um, or four bet it. Although we get cooler there. That queen stand was kind of interesting, though, whether or not to call the turn check raise. Uh, if it was, like, any larger, like, if it was a 3x raise, I probably wouldn't have called it. But given the fact that, like, he kind of min-raised us, we, we're at least going to have some equity, right? We at least have four outs to the gut shot. Because um, the best hand he can have there is queen jack. Well, I guess queen jack when we have queens. Like, we have three outs, right? So, oh, what is this? Because min betting? Yeah, I really like, I usually raise every min bet that I get held into. Although it, at times it works, it does work better than others, um, and it's best. To, it best. It's best for me to do it. Or maybe I shouldn't have re-raised re this pre-flop because the guy's a donk. But it works better than others. A lot. A lot of players do it more. Um, it may not be as profitable now in these games as it used to be. Uh, a lot of times at these lower stakes games, get they like the min bet with complete error or whatever just to fold our opponent. Once he calls though, and he bets again, like he's got to have at least some piece of the board. Although sometimes I do see them having air. Um, I still see uh, when they call the raise, not the much, not as much though that it makes me confident to go ahead and bluff raise again. Like I'm risking seven there to win seven, so like my raise doesn't have to be profitable, but like um, two to one, uh, I do believe. And plus, when he does call me, I do have some equity when called. Like. My king is usually going to be good, so that's going to make like a little bluff raise profitable also. Now, now if he min bets me again, I'm going to be like raising for value probably. 
Um, actually, I probably will raise this gut shot also. Raising gut shots are nice. In this spot situation, I have like a backdoor flush draw, and I have the gut shot. So like I've got a lot of equity here when I'm when I'm called, and I do hit the gut shot. And you see, this time he checks to me. So like, I'm also like buying a free card. And let's go ahead and bet thirteen. Notice how he didn't lead this time. So like, he's really uncertain of whether or not like I'm bluff raising and raising him again. So like the second time I I raise and I fold to him like he's probably gonna be like wary of the fact that I actually do have a hand. Um, so like even if I miss that ten there, I, I am buying a free card uh, to to the river, and the way that he played it, it looks like he didn't even have the king. Um, so it's it pays to be a little bit of aggro. I guess those guys. Like I said I have the backdoor flush draw and like pro possibly an overcard. Or two, um, depending on what kind of hand he has. I doubt he has like top pair there every time he min butts. So it is on the more like aggressive side, and um, you you just can't like do it once and then it doesn't work to stop doing it again. You know you do have to keep in mind that like it is this is a high variance game. Just because it doesn't work once doesn't mean you shouldn't like try it again. Especially if someone is continuing doing the same play over and over again, you know, keep that in mind. I think I've gone ahead and, like, gone past the point of my video. Alright, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, put you guys on pause. I'm going to load up a uh, holder manager here, and we'll go over our session after I sit out. I get dealt this last hand, so I guess I have to play it. All right, guys. I'll be right back. Hey, guys. Welcome back. Uh, here we are doing some Hold'em Manager review. Uh, I haven't done one of these in a while either. As you can see, we played for nearly two hours today. One point nine. I played for nine. One point nine hours. Put a little bit before the first video, and I'm going to go over some of the hands uh, in a little in a minute here about what happened uh, before I started the first video instead of having to replay them. Um, while watching the video. As you can see we played 400 hands, a little bit over that. Uh, we didn't run too well, as you can see we're about break even with EV. Um, we, were, we were pretty aggro, you know, we were 2016. Uh, I think our attempt to steal were, was pretty pretty damn high. Um, let me go ahead and bring up these reports. Uh, one thing that I have to do with... Uh, I, I have these three statistics over here, as you can see it looks like my holder manager is being uh, a bit funky. Let me go ahead and pause the video until it comes back. Alright, and it's back now. <laughs> but, alright, as you can see, I've got these final three stats here. I th also have like one money, one saw flop, which is a PT stat that isn't in the normal um, holder manager. So what I do is I go down here and I add that as a stat selection. Uh, I also add in the button unopened pre-flop raise, cutoff unopened pre-flop raise, and small blind unopened pre-flop raise. And I believe that is the uh, my the correct stats for blind stealing. So as you can see, like when it's folded around to me on the button, I did I was opening quite a bit, and that's usually a little bit too high for me. Although I usually recommend at least like 40, 45 percent from the button. Um, I think cutoff is a good percentage, and probably small blind obviously is going to be a little too high in that spot as well. Let me go ahead and filter these by position. And so what you do is you go ahead and go to the drop down menu and you select the position uh, tab itself. And you can and you can see what all of the posi where you're at by the level by the little positions here. Uh, as you can see, uh, this is what you like to see uh, a gradual increase in percentages as you go down. I really didn't three bet too much on the button. Didn't really have very uh, opportunities to either. So I'm gonna go right now. Let's go over uh, some hand histories. And here we are. And holder manager is very nice for us to have these stats coming up. All right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the first hand we're gonna be playing. Let me go ahead and refresh. 
All right. Uh, we have just an, an open limper here who's got like $16, and we have Ace Queen. Uh, we're not assuming he's going to fold at all. So when he calls, the pot's going to be like $8, maybe $9 with the um, the big with the person in the big blind there. So what's that's going to happen is um, the, the pot's going to be so large that it really can't fold to anything that old alien soul does. Um, so we're already committed to him post flop right now. For us, another player comes in and cold calls also, and so does the short stacker. All right. So the pot is thirteen dollars. This guy's got one pot size bet left, and this guy down here has I think around like sixty dollars or something. Yeah, sixty-one dollars. Um, so against this guy, you know, we're not committed, but against this opponent here, we are committed. So what's going to happen when it folds when it checks around to us? Well. There's still a real strong chance that we have the best hand, right? Um, so when that happens, I am much more likely to just go ahead and see bet it. Get, call this guy's all on anyway, and fold if this guy does anything else. Um, and so these two opponents checks, and I beat out a good eight dollars here, and uh, fully expecting to call this guy's four dollars and ten cent raise, and he, which he does make, he does go all in. And I call, and the I do turn my ace, and because I'm a luck box like that, um, and the river card is a four, and he has five four, so we're gonna go ahead and um, take the pot down there. All right, so the next hand we get king queen suited here. And again, I think we have another limper coming in. Yep. Again with the fourteen dollar guy. Let me go ahead and isolate him up. And he calls. No, I'm sorry, he lip he limp re raises all in. And we're getting like looks like we're getting close to two to one hundred money. One point nine to one thirty five percent. This is nearly like a merely a tournament strategy kind of thing. But yeah, I know from my previous hand that I need I don't even need this much equity. I have probably like forty five, maybe even fifty percent equity here, um, to make the call. So I do call, it's a pretty easy call. I like to gamble with the short stacks also. And once we flop a pair, I feel like I'm pretty golden. Um and he he shows pocket fives and um you go ahead and take it down. All right, so the next hand is kind of interesting because this there's this donk down here on under the gun who who makes the uh, open limp, and I'm putting his range on something fairly wide, anywhere from like Broadway cards to like an ace to suit connectors to pairs. Um, and given this flop here of queen five two, right? If I check to him, I fully expect for him to bet the queen. Fully, I uh, fully expect him to bet like pretty much anything at all on this board, right? Like me and all, like maybe a five. Probably even betting a pair because I know that's what I'm probably gonna be betting when I when I'm checked to also just to take it down. Um, so the nine comes in, I check and he checks again behind. And uh, the river card brings another nine, and he goes ahead and bets like three dollars. And I and for one, I'm just like, what in the world? If he has if he has a nine on the turn. He's gonna be betting it. So like the only hand that he could possibly have here that he's doing this for value is like pocket twos, maybe pocket fives, or like pocket aces or something. But I'm not really buying that. So I go ahead and make the call. And he shows King Jack offsuit and I ship the pot. Which it's not really that much money, but um, it's I just kinda show you guys my thought process there on calling that river bet. Alright, so we have like the six, seven of uh, clubs here, and this will be our final hand. We raise it up in early early position, and I mean I do this from time to time just to maybe uh, merge my range a little bit, and also to make it look like I'm not dead at the table. So this guy who's who's fairly uh, weak, I think I already showed this to you guys, so I'm gonna go ahead and show it to you all in full again in case you guys missed it in the first first round. But I go ahead and I value bet my six. It's kind of like a value bet, but I also take the pot down. 
Yeah, he's gonna call me with a flush draw, but he's also gonna call me with a queen and ten. So, like, there's some value there, although not too much. So it's kind of a marginal spot. Um, I check it back now. The ten doesn't really hurt my hand all too much because you know, um, it is a ten. I don't think he's gonna be folding like any queen or ten now. And I could still bet it, maybe get some value from a flush draw, although I think it's very unlikely for me to get two straights of value from a flush draw. And it's just with my weaker hand range. And the river card brings like the third ten. And he bets eight dollars. And I the only hand that I can see him doing this with is a queen for value. Um, that's it. Um and I'm getting almost three to one on my money. So, like, how often does he have to have a complete bluff here for me to make make money on this call? Uh, not too often, right? So I need, I don't need to be good, probably like twenty. Yeah, I need to be good twenty six percent of the time to make this call. And I think, given the number of draws in the flop, including like gut shots and flush draws and open end straight draws and you know anything, um, I'm going to be probably at least good enough this amount. Although, it might be kind of close. And I go ahead and I call, and he I get chipped the pot with the. Uh, the ace king. Okay. So, all right, guys. This has been Code Red Rules, and I'll go ahead and see you guys next time. Good look at the tables.